This is Being Human, Judy Rees, writer, speaker, clean language maestro. Welcome. Hello. Hello. So let's let's start there. So for all the people who hear clean language and think that's just not effing and blinding, what um what is what a clean language mean for you? It's also not speaking clearly, and it's also not um the software the software language called clean. Um okay. so that, so, and it's also not, if, if some of your listeners have done NLP, neurolinguistic programming, it's also not quite the same thing as clean language in NLP. Okay. So, so th- that's always the first thing that I do when I talk about, I try not to start by talking about clean language if I can avoid it, because I'm much more interested in what it does and what learning it does um, to the way people think and the way they interact with other people. Um, One of the things that's most curious about the effect of learning clean language on people is how it makes them curious about other people. Right, okay. Typically, um, we go through the world imagining that everybody else is the same as us. And um, it's, it's a shorthand that evolution has equipped us with. Assume other other human beings are experiencing the same thing you're experiencing and we even extend it out to our pets and other animals we assume that our cats and dogs are assume, uh, are experiencing a similar wor- world to ours but actually their world is different to ours because everybody perceives the world differently everybody experiences the world differently and when people start to learn clean language they start to discover just how different the other person's world can be and that well it, it's it's like it turns people on to um real interactions with other human beings i'm not saying the the it's the only way of doing this there are lots of other ways lsd i believe is a way that works rather well as well okay <laughs> a few years ago there was a, a group of us where, where it, we're in correspondence about what what's the what are the similarities and differences between using clean language and and going on LSD trip, and we found a whole bunch of similarities as well as obviously significant differences, because at its uh, at its most basic level, what clean language precision inquiry methodology? It's a way of asking questions and listening to the answers and asking more questions in a precise and targeted way such that you find out more about the other person's world. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's, that's interesting. And, and sort of from my experience of having done it, it, it can feel a bit like a trip. I mean, it's, it, you end up in these just marvellous conversations that take you in, into realms you never expected to go um, and accesses parts of your imagination you never thought you had. Um, so, so, yeah, that really, that really resonates, this idea of it's a bit like and a do- trip. And doing all of that, when you're asking clean language questions, you're not um, trying to take someone on a trip. You're, you're just exercising your curiosity. You're having fun inquiring about how they're doing their thing. But the quality of your attention determines the quality of the other person's thinking. So okay. by actually really being curious, by really directing the other person's attention to the bits that as the questioner you're curious about hopefully that takes the other person to the edge of what they already know and starts to to take them into parts of their thinking they don't often go so often particularly when when the world's busy and we're we're doing so much stuff um we think on rails we think in the same way we always think but that's only using a tiny fraction of our ability to to think and to experience the world. Okay, so it's a it's a way of opening, opening conversations, taking people off their rails. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so, for our listeners, can you? What's a good way to bring this to life with to the life with something very concrete? I mean, I've read the I've read the clean language book, and there are. Well, I mean, there are exercises in how to explore metaphor. There's one where you represent your family as stacks of coins. 
And that's a very visceral way of understanding how easily it is for us to access metaphor. But is, it, is, there a, is there something we could do now or is there a set, what, a set of questions or where, where, how can we bring it to life? Oh, there are so many ways to bring it to life. It depends very much on what people are curious about. Um, often when I'm working with a group at a conference or whatever, all I do is get them to pay attention to paying attention and what happens when they actually pay attention. I get people just to listen to the other person for two minutes and then swap over and listen the other way around. And as the listener, their job is to, to just keep listening and keep encouraging the other person to keep talking without themselves speaking. And what that does is to, um, it, when you're being listened to, what you notice is that you do more thinking, you do better thinking, and you think about um, stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily think about. At the same time, it feels like you're building a much stronger relationship with the person who's doing the listening. Um, the rapport develops very strongly. And you can build on that same activity. You say, this time, rather than just listening, this time you can repeat back two or three of the other person's words or um, just start to, or, or two or three of their keywords. And obviously when people are doing this for the first time, it feels awkward or what am I doing? But the person being listened to, hearing their words back, loves it, even if you feel awkward. Um, and it can be really good fun to, to, to notice how the person who being listened to doesn't notice their own words coming back. I was talking at a conference um, the other day. Um, we did that activity with three words to repeating back and somebody put their hand up and said, oh, but that was so uncomfortable. Um, I really can't imagine doing that in real life. And I said, and uncomfortable and not in real life. And yes, he said, this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and I repeated back the last thing, three things he said. And oh, yes, and you've got it. Yes. I re and, and I repeated back that. And all around the room, lights were going on. I did it once more and then stopped because people were starting to giggle <laughs> and explained what I was doing. And the guy had literally no idea I'd been playing his words back to him. Right. OK, well, that's a skill because he, cause certainly my experience of sometimes take, having that technique of repeating back well, sometimes what the other person has said. I mean, in fact, I've done it with, with, uh, with my fiance and I have supremely annoyed her on occasion she's like stop embarrassing me stop saying what, exactly what i've just said so there's obviously an art to doing it where the other person doesn't feel like you're just being a a tape recorder repeating back yeah so there is an art to it and there is uh it takes practice um, so effectively can we demonstrate clean language I tend to jump to tend to try not to jump to the thing which is unique about or the things which are unique about clean language because this chunk about paying attention and what happens when you pay somebody full attention and what happens when you play somebody's words back to them although they're not unique to clean language they are very very fundamental to how clean language works um, that repeating back of um, somebody's words is allegedly the nearest thing that the FBI have to a Jedi mind trick, um, according to Chris Voss in, ne in Never Split the Difference. He was the FBI's lead hostage negotiator, and he uses a number of techniques that we generally recognize as coaching or that kind of interpersonal technique because he realized and his team realized that a hostage negotiation is not about rationally getting to yes by calculating formulate, formulas. A hostage negotiation and the fact of the matter, most negotiations are actually about people connecting on a human level. And when people connect on a human level, then magic can start to happen. Then you can really get to win-win 
because you know what matters to the other person and you know what matters to you because they're curious enough to find out. And to a large extent, clean language fits into that kind of category. It's about building the relationship between two people such that they really under, understand each other. Um, so at the practical skill level, there are two things which are pretty much unique to clean language. There are some specific questions, and there is the way clean language works with metaphor. As far as I know, and I've, I've been out in the, the world using clean language for long enough for somebody to have told me, the way clean language works with metaphor is unique. Um, the questions are not unique in themselves. They're ordinary English language questions. It's the metaphor that's different. So maybe that's where we should go in terms of showing people what clean language is and can do. Great. Yeah, let's go there. So if I was doing this with, with the group, I might ask a question. And, and if I may test it out on you, Different. I might ask a question like, when you are working at your best, you are like, what? Good one. Uh, when I'm working my best, I am like, like a mirror. Yeah, like a like a like mirror, a mirror. Shining, hmm. shining back someone's light. And a mirror shining back someone's light. And is there anything else about a mirror? It's it's clean. <laughs> it's. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it's neutral. It's it's strong. Mm -hmm. It's uh, clean. Yeah, it's solid. Beautiful, strong, solid, and a mirror like that shining back someone's light. What kind of shining? A brilliant shining. Uh, Radiant shining, a broad shining, you know, mm -hmm. uh, expansive. Broad, shining. radiant shining, expansive, like that. And the mirror, solid and clean, like that, and shining, brilliant. Yeah, yeah I'm beaming as you say this. I can, I can feel the effect. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're beaming like that and shining back someone's light, is there a relationship between beaming and shining back someone's light. Yes, it's a it's a contribution because at the same time as I'm feeling great and contributing, I am sharing their contribution. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else about beaming like that? It, it's uh, it's enlivening. Mm -hmm. Enriching has great energy. Mm. Now, can I, I'm going to ask you a, a clean language question, which is different to other other kinds of questions. So, when a mirror like that, whereabouts is mirror? It's it's solid. It's in the centre. It's directly opposite you. It's directly opposite the person I'm talking to. It's it's squarely on them, focused on them. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's squarely on them, in the centre. Whereabouts centre? Whereabouts centre? Um, so I'm imagining like a, 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 a shaft of light or a pole that's, that's, that's up and down and in front of me. Mm -hmm. and, and the mirror is, is aligned to that. It's like a, a, on a mm. slider, except it's, it's slid down to where it's directly opposite you. Mm. So a shaft of light and the mirror on a slider and slid down to where it's directly opposite. Mm. And is there anything else about that? Well, it's beautiful. I know you've used that word before. It's ornate. I, I'm imagining a, mm. an ornate frame. Yeah. It's crafted, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's human in a sense. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Now, if 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 I was going, so if we were going to continue, I, I I might ask you questions like, what needs to happen for a mirror like that, or what needs to happen for that shaft of light? 
Um, but hopefully that gives a quick demonstration of, of where one can go with just a very few minutes of clean language questions and using metaphor in the way that clean language does. Yeah, I mean, so powerful. And what it's, I can see why people draw the parallel to LSD. Not that I've ever taken LSD, but it, it does feel like a slightly altered state of consciousness. It, it feels like it felt like I went slightly sideways in my thinking process. Mm -hmm. Kind of so, sideways is that I think to myself. But yes, it's. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's so lateral, as yeah, it's, it has this this sense of a shift. Yeah. Mm. So I'm curious, how much of what you just told me did you already know before we started the conversation? None. I mean, none. Not, not to that depth. I mean, I probably knew. So the only part of that I guess I was consciously aware of was energy level. I do know, mm -hmm. having done a few of these interviews now, that energy level re really matters, right? So if I'm not mm -hmm. in a high energetic state, it does affect the conversation. And mm -hmm. so that... That's familiar to me, the part of that conversation that was about energy, but the, but the rest of it, not not clear and concrete, you know, in my soul, mm. was that was that something that was was very mm. clear to me. So no, that that definitely brought a new understanding to mm. who I need to be and being in these conversations. So if I was coaching you, I might send you off to draw what you now know. Okay. Um, or find a picture on the internet of that kind of mirror and draw it with the shaft of light and all of that. Um, if I was working with you amongst a team, which is one of the things I most often do with clean language, um, and this was a team kind of context, you know, you when you, Richard, are doing are working at your best, you're like a mirror. When I, Judy, am working at my best, I'm like a, a clockwork octopus juggling on a unicycle. Yes. Um, now you can see I can, sorry, then how we might ignore that. What, what was that? <laughs> I, I missed that tab of uh, an, an, octopus. Octopus. an octopus on a unicycle. Right, and did it have a colour? Juggling. Okay. I'm like an octopus on a unicycle juggling. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so okay, so so maybe I shouldn't have said it quite so quickly. I'm like an octopus on a unicycle juggling and you can see how we might annoy each other if we work together because I'd be in constant motion I'm on my unicycle I'm juggling meanwhile you're wanting to be directly opposite me yeah and that might not be and, and that that could that could really get quite um <laughs> When under, when teams understand these things about each other, they can then accommodate. Oh, for her to be at her best, she has to be moving. She's mm -hmm. not doing it just to me. For him to be at doing his best work, he needs to reflect, and it needs to be in the exact position. Maybe I need to accommodate and be more still at certain times, and so on. You see how this works with a team. Mm, mm. And what's immediately coming to me is I, I've always been very sceptical. In fact, I never really use them, these personality tests and personality profiles and because they always seem so reductive. And, and this feels like a much richer way to explore differences between individuals, more creative, more fun, and captures, a, I suspect, a lot more of nuance and that of who people are and, and is more engaging. As, you know, I, can, I can really see also quicker and much 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 more efficient and if you compare what we just did to the time it would take to do a personality profile yes there's all the time to fill it in but then there's a the time for somebody to analyze it and write one of those interminable reports <laughs> and then you have to work out what red green and blue actually mean and these initials and those initials mean this and that and the other and you're trying to put together this ridiculously complicated jigsaw by the time you've invested all that time in that personality profile it's going to be right you don't care whether it's actually right or not you've just spent virtually a whole day of your life faffing about with this thing 
So you've spent the, the, the you've spent so much time on it. You're invested in it. That means you are going to agree with it. Um, not necessarily, but certainly a much higher likelihood than if you if it was just a two minute job. Right. That's probably the downside of clean language because it is so quick and efficient. People think, oh, it's nothing, but mm. actually it takes a little bit of time to to get the hang of it. Yeah, um, just as it takes a little bit of time to practice repeating back somebody's words so they don't notice, um, getting good at clean language where you can learn the basics in a day. You know, you've got the basic drift of it, but the actual practice that makes you good at it, fine. Also, I remember right back when I started as a software engineer, and one of the things that I read in extreme programming for any software engineers out there was that. Um, the importance of a team building a metaphor about what it is they were building, and I can imagine that that would translate to any any creative endeavor um, where teams are involved. So, can it be used for teams generating a, a collective metaphor to describe the endeavor they're they're working on? It can. I think clean language is at its best when it's used for individual metaphors. That's that's what it was originally designed to do. Mm. But it certainly can be used to devise a system metaphor. And I understand that XP dropped the requirement for system metaphors because people found it too difficult. They couldn't operationalize that requirement for a system metaphor. And certainly clean language offers a way to do that in a fairly reliable way. You know, you, uh, you could just ask the question that I asked you at the beginning, which is, and, and when this system is as is at its best or as we'd like it to be, it will be like what? But there's a much more effective way of, of doing that, which is to start by asking more questions about the features and indeed the benefits of the system. Ask some clean language questions about them. And ask some of that slightly unusual clean language question, where and whereabouts are those features? And then once you've got a whole bunch of bits, then you go and feature and feature and feature and feature and feature and benefit and benefit. And all of that is like what? Mm. Yeah, and then a, a metaphor will often just spring unbidden into the room. Um, so, so that little process is technically called feeling to metaphors. David Grove, who devised clean language, devised it to go from a feeling to a metaphor or a, a reported feeling. But actually, I think it works brilliantly for, for getting to a system metaphor. Hmm. Yeah. And I can, I can imagine, although I've not got any experience of this, how you could use it for, I don't know, if you're if you're a team of people building a community center or any 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 activity where you've you've got to create something together or or a book as, as the co-authoring a book i can i can just imagine a lot of applications potentially this can be a really powerful part of the initial creative process mm. yeah i think it could be really quite good fun to do in various various different situations one of the things to remember, though, is that the, the metaphor may that you, you as an individual come up with may or may not be one that works for other people. Mm. So one of the things I've noticed through the clean language community, then, you know, there are a few hundred of us worldwide, is people will ha have clean language coaching about launching their business and will come up with some wacky idea like my octopus on its unicycle. And they'll launch their business and they'll, they'll go, right, this is the octopus on a unicycle business. And people will just look at them like they're insane. <laughs> right. So when you're doing it, because the experience is so intense as an individual, one needs to remember that individuals need to come together with other people and shared metaphors are typically not so intense, not so vivid and not so idiosyncratic. Right. Once we're in a shared metaphor territory, we need to be talking about the kind of metaphors that are accessible to other people. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm interested, where did you start 
with clean you know what wh- wh- why are you so interested in in language in communication in in listening and and where did you start with this well um i've always been interested in in language and metaphor i suppose is the answer because so when i was a teenager for example my my father was doing research into the role of metaphor in edu- in education um in those days, that meant you. So he was analysing the metaphors being used in educational documentation, and that meant going physically going through piles and piles of paper that had been left in the um, cellar of a college that was near where we lived. So, and and he wrote his uh, thesis about that. So metaphor has been part of my life all my life. Um, then I became a news journalist where. I, I really got into asking questions, paying attention, and then directing attention with questions. Uh, I, I, I was not a TV journalist, I was a newspaper journalist, which meant that uh, what, what we learned in college was um, everybody's got a story, it's up to you as a reporter to find it. So it, for me, that that inquiring into what the other person who the other person really is and what's important to them and all that kind of thing was just part of my my trade. And then um, many years later, after I'd moved to London, become an executive editor at Teletext, um, I became involved first in NLP and then discovered clean language, at which point various pieces slotted into place. And I thought, oh, this is exciting. I a, I can do it really well. I was already had the base skills to be able to adopt clean language. But B, I could see the advantages of it. So at Teletext, we'd been tr- trying to take our TV-based and, and, news stories. And Teletext for people who... <laughs> oh, oh, oh are, are we international? Oh, oh, actually, I suppose we're, we're, we've got an age range as well. So there may even be people listening who are too young to remember Teletext. Too too young to remember Bamba Boozler. <laughs> So, Teletext was a sort of proto-internet which lived on analogue TV. Um, In the UK and in Europe, you would press a button on your TV and you could find pages and pages of news and information and features and get things like the stock prices and flight arrival times. And on Teletext itself, the service I worked on, you would also get advertising for holidays. And on Teletext on Channel 4, some some people will remember um, Digitizer, which was the computer buffs feature page, and also uh, Bamba Boozler, who was the quiz master on Teletext. And you could play a quiz on Teletext. Is that a sufficient explanation, Richard? It is. It's It's taking me back, yeah. So we we pioneered, so, you, basically you're an internet pioneer, Jude. Yeah, I suppose so because we were desperately trying to take teletext, the, all this wonderful stuff. We were trying to figure out how to take it from being an analog product into the digital world, onto the internet, onto mobile phones, onto digital TV. So I was deeply involved in a whole bunch of IT projects. In, in my, even though I was a journalist, I was. What now I suppose would be a product owner or product manager or something like that, trying to get this product onto the internet. And we failed. Um, Teletext no longer exists except you, you can actually find Bamba Boozler somewhere on the web, I think. Um, but we failed. But I very quickly afterwards, I realized that if we'd had clean language as a way of helping us work together and really understand what each other were meaning by various things, we, we'd have stood a much better chance of doing what we were trying to do. As with so many IT projects, misunderstandings and conflicts were everywhere in mm. those projects. If we were able to communicate more clearly, we would have been able to smooth those out, get more done, and potentially hit the... Uh, very, very tight, very challenging deadlines that we had and actually carry our service over. Um, Yeah, so it it makes me sad to think about that because um, it mattered to me, Teletext. I I loved what we did there. 
and I think it was a real shame we 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 didn't succeed in 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 bridging the gap. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. I suppose that's a lesson for anyone. If, if this or something to consider for people who are having communication issues in their teams, in their families, whatever their context, that uh, this this could be something to, to dip into and uh, give a try. Um, you you wrote in, on your blog recently about um, your dialogue on social media and, and this current issue. Do you see a a role for clean language at a societal level, or you know, what, what's the sort of biggest vista for you when you think about when you think about clean language? Mm. I think there is a societal piece. I don't, I don't think it's necessary so much uh, about the skill of. Um, doing clean language with someone as I just did with you I don't mm. think that's the important piece I think the important piece is the fact that the act of learning clean language forces you to become curious about another person to acknowledge them as human mm. and to start to find out about them I think and, and in doing that normally because you're, you're working with other people in a group you become more aware of your own stuff you become more aware of your own preferences, your own issues, the things that annoy you, and you become clear about which bits belong to you and which bits belong to them. And I think if if we as a society can become clearer about ourselves and our relation to other people, I think that I'm not going to say I, I haven't thought it through to the extent that I'm willing to go. I think that's going to change the world. But what I've noticed is that when I've noticed that clean language enthusiasts tend to be nice people. I run, a, run an event called Metaforum, which brings together clean language enthusiasts from around the world in a one day online unconference. We get a bunch of Zoom rooms together and, 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 we, and we, we do whatever we want to do as a group of 100, 150 or so clean language enthusiasts. An unconference for people? What's an unconference? So an unconference is the opposite of one of those internet summits where people just spout for an hour and you pay money to listen to it. In an unconference, you co-create the event with the other attendees. The assumption is that everybody's got brilliant stuff to share. Um, some people will want to lead sessions. Some people want to participate in sessions. Um, but the the power differential is removed. We, we're not categorizing the world as the speakers who speak down to everybody else and listeners who um, just listen. And I think in amongst the Agile community, unconference is, is a pretty ordinary thing nowadays. Outside of the Agile world, it's probably still unusual, isn't it? It's quite scary to think. Um, yes, yes, that's right. And, so, um, so, and, and, and do, doing it in an online event is very unusual. So there are really not very many online unconferences that exist. Um, certainly very few that use um, video conferencing as the, as the format rather than some kind of text-based thing. Um, so we get everybody together all over the world. We've got people in Australia, people in Russia, people in America and so on. And everybody comes and everybody participates. And everybody's always lovely. And I think there is something about mastering clean language which makes you a better human being, that makes you a lovelier person. Because you're more aware of your own stuff and you're more aware of the difference between you and another person. And that difference, rather than making you dislike the other person, makes you excited and curious. Hmm. You know, you'll, you'll get people who will do, in inverted commas, diversity training, where they try and reduce the differences between different, for example, races or, or between the sexes within an organisation. But what a waste. Hmm. Hmm. Um, what's brilliant about human beings is they are all different. Hmm. But while difference is threatening, then difference is unwanted. Hmm. Once, you, once you become aware that you can work really well with difference, that difference can be enjoyed, that you can explore difference, that it's interesting, 
and fun and can spark all sorts of other stuff, then I think it's well worth, you know, uh, my colleague Caitlin Walker does stuff that's labelled diversity training. She teaches clean language um, Mm. because that enables people to become aware of the diversity in the room, acknowledge it and use it and enjoy it. Mm. I can see that. And I suppose once you start relating to somebody as an octopus on a unicycle, you, you sort of tend to forget what skin colour they are or, or, uh, or, what, or what, what gender. Yeah, mm. I can see that. Yeah. And, and of course, there are, there are general cultural patterns about comfort with asking questions and those kind of things. And they're just cultural patterns. They can be, they, they can be, Used, they can be enjoyed, they can be noticed, and where where required, they can be overcome. And to some extent, I think there is a need to overcome people's shyness, reluctance, um, these kind of things. Because if we all just spend our life, I, I speak as a former extremely shy person. Hmm. If we all spend our lives hiding we never get to find out about each other. So there is a stepping into the discomfort of doing something which is different, which is new, um, that needs to happen. So while I'm, I'm delighted to acknowledge the diversity, the, the, in particular the neurodiversity um, that's around us all the time, um, I think that it is essential that, in order to find out more about each other, we do things that are sometimes uncomfortable for ourselves. Um, another colleague, Nancy, Nancy Doyle, runs an organisation called Genius Within, which works um, with um, all kinds of neurodiverse individuals, helping them to fit in to the workplace. Um, and uh, she uses a lot of clean language in that process. A, to find out about the individuals and what specifically is um, is going on for them and how she can she's written a rather excellent blog post about what happens in your ordinary assessment of somebody's disability is they're assessing disability they're trying to establish what the person can't do which is terribly dispiriting and doesn't help anybody to figure out what the person can do and what they could be really really good at Hmm. So she, she uses clean language to do assessments of what the person can do and what they want to do and what excites them and what interests them and then helps them to figure out how to do it. Um, in the process, of course, they are also learning to use clean language and learning about typically the other people in their group and in, in, the, in their workplace and all these kind of things. Hmm. So I've gone off, gone off on one, but... No. Uh, no, no, it's, fa- it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, no, no, I can really see how this breaks through. Um, I, yeah, I suppose the human tendency to want to categorise and and profile people and 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 stick to assumptions they have about people, and that for me is hits the <clears throat> this point about discomfort is you know perhaps there is something that's quite uncomfortable about testing the assumptions we have about other people in a in a sort of deep questioning process. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you can't necessarily do it all the time. You know, if, if somebody running a busy bar had to stop and check in with the details of who somebody really was before pouring them a pint, <laughs> nobody would ever get a drink. On the other hand, if you look at the really high-end kind of hotels and all these kind of things and the concierge services, those kind of things, they find out in minute detail about what a person, who a person is, what their preferences are, all those kind of things, before that person arrives in their hotel. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this finding out about people and acknowledging them as, as individual human beings rather than just as members of a mass is, is very high-value stuff. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, going back to your earlier point about clean language people being lovely people, I can see the cynics saying, oh, well, you know, is this, is this really causational? Is this just correlation? Is it just that lovely people are drawn to conversations about communication and listening and they were lovely to start with? 
That's a, a very good question. I can't um, give a straight answer. What I can say is that when people turn up for the first day of a workshop, um, my presupposition, obviously, as the trainer, is that they are lovely people. And their behaviour doesn't necessarily hint at lovely on day one. Right. <laughs> so people come into workshops with all the stuff that goes on for them going on. You know, they'll be cross. <laughs> I remember one, one occasion when day one, morning one, this particular participant was absolutely furious about the venue. She was... It, it was a, a rugby club, um, which happens to, to be in a co convenient location. And so the facilities were not top-end hotel. They were, it was a sports club. But the room was, was nice and well lit, and there were beautiful grounds that we could use for the breakout and all that kind of thing. And she was absolutely furious about the fact that there were changing rooms as well as toilets. And she went absolutely ballistic. Now, what I know later is that she became what I would describe as a lovely person. Now, I don't know whether it's the process of learning clean language or other processes that were going on in her life or, or just the... No, we did take her back to that venue a number of times. She never complained again. But she did quite a lot of training with us in the end. Right. So I don't. It's it's only one example, and and we 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 can't say whether which is causality and which is correlation. Um, but I, I my gut feel is that being curious about other people rather than judgmental about other people, which is something which I see time and time again being literally switched on during a workshop. I see the lights go on. Oh, they're not the same as me. And it just, the, a penny drops, the lights go on, and people become curious. And when people are curious rather than judgmental, they become nicer people, in my opinion. If we think about a few of the most judgmental people that are in, in our world at the moment, they're not lovely people, and they're not curious people. They're people that assume that it, it's almost as if they see the rest of the world as a caricature, some kind of cartoon, as not real. If they, if they thought that human beings were real people, they wouldn't do what they were doing. Um, if, if you, did, I, I suppose it's, uh, we shouldn't do too much current affairs, but things like um, the immigration thing that's been going on in the UK recently, if the politicians had really thought about the people involved as being people who'd spent their entire lives, 60 plus years, living in a country who was suddenly being deported to a country they had no connection with whatsoever, if they'd actually thought about that, thought about them as human beings, they couldn't have signed the orders. It wouldn't have been possible to do it, in my opinion. Hmm. Had they had that curiosity. Mm. Yeah. And I, I do acknowledge that people in, in, in government and in, in large organisations of all kinds, it can be very difficult to get to the level of curiosity that would be needed. And, and obviously there, there are systems and all those kind of things. And I think that our politicians need to acknowledge that people are people first. Right. Yeah. You mentioned process a little bit in, when we were just talking about, about the way you train people. And interestingly, when I asked you before this interview what your, your goals were, um, you, you declined to answer that, that question and talked about your process. So you're the second interviewee I've had on, on Being Human who, who's, who's been sceptical about the, the importance of goals. So, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, I, I, maybe it's just because I'm not very good at goals. Um, I, I find it really difficult to, and always have. I, I, the first talk I ever gave at the NLP conference a large number of years ago was all about the uh, scepticism for the big, bright, shiny goal. Um, make it big, make it loud, make it brightly coloured. 
people used to say, put it on a screen and, and think about it every morning. And I just think, that, <laughs> A, I can't do it. But B, I just think, doesn't that just make you feel really disappointed when you don't get it and stop you feeling happy in, in the moment? Um, because so much of, you know, if, if we're always rushing to a goal, are we missing what's going on right now? Or, or So, yes, I do have goals in terms of a week, a day or, or a week or even a month. But I, I, I tend not to believe in them in terms of a year or 10 years. Um, I'd much rather be following a process that brings me joy in the day and in the week. Um, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm constantly doing the soft thing. So um, my process includes fairly substantial amounts of physical exercise. I, I, I swim, I bike, I run. My husband does does iron distance triathlon, but I don't. Um, but I, I'm I'm exercising six days out of seven, sometimes twice a day. Um, I'm quite disciplined with my diet. Those kind of things, um, because those processes actually make me feel better um, and make me do better work. Um, I no longer ha- feel I have a, a big goal to spread the. Um, gospel of clean language i did at one time um when i was working with uh, wendy sullivan the co-author of the book clean language revealing metaphors and opening minds um, when we were working together we had a uh, an objective a goal to uh get clean language out there get everybody talking about clean language all around the world we wanted to be you know bigger than the beatles kind of thing um but the truth was we never were going to be and it just made us more and more cross that we weren't getting anywhere. It felt like we weren't getting anywhere. Um, what By keeping our eye on that big goal, we were failing to connect at a human level, I think, with, with some of the people who wanted to connect with us. Um, and we were failing to pay attention to, well, let's be more specific. What, you know, if we want to be out there or, or like that, well, what's the process that needs to get us there? And our processes were not very good either. Okay, and you think having the and focusing more on the goal and less on the processes was was, was hindering you, Pat? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm still not very brilliant at processes, but where the processes are in place in my life, I, I find myself having more success than where they're not. Right. It does remind me of um something Dave Snowden talks about, who's also been on, on the podcast and talks about managing the evolutionary potential of the present. Oh, that's a nice phrase. Very nice phrase. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, so we close out. Thank you so much before, before we end, would you like to tell people where they can find you, uh, find more information about clean language? Um, if they want to get started, if they want to dig a bit deeper. Yeah, so I'm very easy to find online. So Judy Reese, judyreese.co.uk, not judyreese.com, which is a, a real estate agent in, in Florida, but judyreese.co.uk or Judy Reese on Twitter or on LinkedIn or, or on, on Facebook. Um, if you go to my website, there's a place there where you can get my newsletter, which is um, a weekly um gathering of interesting stuff from this kind of world so not just clean language but also agile self-organization metaphor um, working with groups facilitation all those kind of things all tend to be covered in my newsletter it's a bit eclectic but people seem to love it about three and a half thousand people get it every week Um, so do sign up for that and also on my website you can find um, links to my online training programs so you you can train with me either through a recorded program or you can join me in an online live class um we do it like an evening class but over video conference over zoom and um periodically i do workshops that they aren't very frequent but we do them sometimes and uh, i also do work in organizations particularly with distributed teams so because i do my stuff over video conference if you've got a, a team that's based all over the place and you want to do some team development, I'm your person. <laughs> so that's where you can find me. Fantastic. Okay, Judy Reese, thank you for being human.